The final step really is the different choices you make now that you have acknowledged, recognized, and honored your new identity, right? Because that's, that's the end of the pattern and the beginning of the next one. Hey, you. Thanks for tuning in. Just a quick heads up, this episode is rated PG-13, so expect to hear some mild language or adult concepts. Hello, Radiant Rebecca. Hey there, Sean. So the title of this episode is Recognize. <laughs> I like the way you said that, like, <laughs> bring it, recognize. Bring it, recognize, yeah. <laughs> If you have listened to the entire playlist, uh, I know you have, Rebecca, but if everybody else has listened to the entire playlist, congratulations, you're on the last one. If you haven't, it's time to take the red pill and start over. It's time to go <laughs> back over to episode 98 is where we started on this. Hang on, wait a minute. Did we get the red pill and the blue pill thing right? I think we might have flipped them. Uh, let's see. Red pill says that's where you show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Oh, well. All right, then. <laughs> so, okay. I'm glad we got that right. Um, this is the last in the playlist that was created with you, me, and a few other people entitled Loving Courageously. Yes, that's right. And if you don't know what we're talking about, you're probably listening to this episode in order of date, which means uh, you haven't heard the other episodes yet or you don't have the context. If you do want to know what that Loving Courageously playlist is all about in a nutshell... I've curated episodes from the show that I feel like they're experiences that have helped me expand my own personal self-respect and in that way, be a better partner and be able to show up more fully to the people that I care about. And I think it's a really brilliant playlist. It's an easy way to get some of the best episodes from the show to make the most impact in your own life. And this is the final episode. And the beginning episode was? The beginning episode was uh, episode 98, Loving Courageously. Loving Courageously. Yeah, this has been a fantastic playlist. And I love that this was all put together. We talked about in the beginning that clarity leads to bravery. It's a great way to get started. Well, great. Shall we get started? This is a really important aspect. In the past, we talked about taking the red pill, right? Taking the, the one that leads to self-discovery, leads to opening one's eyes, leads to opening one's heart and self to growth. And then this episode is about recognizing that you did it. Hell yes. I, I love that. And I think it's important to point out the reason this is the last episode in this playlist, in this Loving Courageously playlist, is because it's the final step in creating a whole new pattern is looking at yourself, updating your identity for who you are now and using that new positive, real, current, truthful identity of yourself to say, okay, what matters most now? What am I going to do in the next chunk of time that comes up? Ooh, we have so much to talk about. Mm, yes, we do. I want to dive deep with you uh, along that thought that you just had as far as the why. Before we get to that, let's talk about how. How do you personally get started in recognizing changes, recognizing things inside yourself? Mm, you know, I, I think this is a tricky question because every day we see our own incremental improvements as just normal. And so especially the longer period of time we go without taking a good look at ourselves from a different perspective, the harder it is for us to see how far we've actually come. And so if it's been a while since you've done this kind of look at your life, you might find that there's a whole lot of things there that you didn't expect to be there. I, I usually find that, and I've been doing this about once a year for the last couple of years. And I appreciate that because... What it has helped me do is to see my value in an ever-increasing way, see my own measure of self-respect in concrete ways. And like, okay, this is the belief that I changed about myself and I did it about this time of the year. And I'll look at all of these other things that have opened up since then. I wouldn't have noticed them or called them that as they were happening because they felt like like one small little movement in that direction after another. But one small movement in the direction of where you want every couple of seconds or every couple of days gets you pretty far in the direction of what you care about, right? So that's why it matters to me. 
Tony Robbins says that people often overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in 10. And this whole, and the, the idea of making sure that we're noticing those little incremental changes and making those small changes is a big deal. So you like to do that about once a year? I do like to do that about once a year. I found that in the past, I normally do it around the turn of the year, December, January, February, something like that. This year in particular has felt fairly chaotic and strange. And like my normal end of the year processes never really felt like they were organized or clear enough for me to dive into them until about this week. I don't know why, but for some reason now it feels like, oh yeah, now the year is done. Time to move forward. Maybe I'm on the Chinese New Year cycle and I just didn't realize this. <laughs> and the point is, is that it just gets done. I mean, it could be a year, it could be 15 months, it could be 18 months, just get it done. Yeah. And it's not like, get it done. You must get this thing done because it's important for you. It's do this because as you do this, you refill your own tank. You remind yourself of what a badass you are by whatever definition you decide badass is, right? Because if you're doing these small things on a regular basis that match up with who you are, then over time it's made enough of a difference towards the direction of what you want that when you look back, you'll be surprised. So if you look at it, you know, approximately every year, it's almost like looking at a child, mm -hmm. you know, you don't notice their growth if you're with them every day, but you know, you go back and you see your nephew, you're just like, whoa, look at how big you've gotten in a year. Yeah. Yeah. So this is kind of the equivalent of letting them stand up against the door jam and just marking how tall they are with a pencil every few months. There, oh, that's a guy. I love that. Do you have any processes that you use to do this sort of self-evaluation? I do. I have a couple of different processes that I've used over time. And I think I think it's appropriate that the process that I use to collate my successes grows as I do. And when I started doing this, I don't remember how long ago it was, but I just had this list on my phone. It was a numbered list. And it was a list of all of the things that I ever felt proud of. Anything that I felt like was an accomplishment, I put on that list. And there was bizarre stuff. There was like doing the 50, kind of like the reverse burpee. So I did 50 of those in a martial arts class. I was the last one to finish. Everyone cheered me on at the end, but I still got them done. I was so proud of that. I still am. Years later, it's got nothing to do with who I am right now, but it shows a quality that I have inside myself. And that moment in time encapsulated my ability to tap into that quality and use it when I needed to. And so that is just this very potent reminder of, oh, yeah, look at you. Here you go. <laughs> you can do things that you never thought you could. Yeah. So would you take would you take a calendar and would you be like, this is the spot that I was in or this is the things that I was going through and how I felt like to kind of quantify where you're at now versus at some previous period of time? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. That's what I've done for the last couple of years. There's another podcaster named Srini Rao who has a podcast called The Unmistakable Creative. He opened up a community called The Unmistakable Prime. I might have updated the name now. But in there, he, he created a bunch of useful resources for creative people to continue to have some kind of rhythm and pattern in their life, some kind of schedule or routine that supports the creativity. And one of the things that he did was he created this pamphlet, like 40 page long annual review book. <laughs> and the last couple of years, I've filled it out. I've printed it out and filled it out. And it has been really, really cool. So one of the first steps I remember was taking a look at your calendar for the last year. And I put everything in my Google calendar. So this is a really clear way for me to see what actually was happening, particularly the year of the pandemic and the year after that, because so many things shifted and they were big and it was happening like every week something new would happen. So going through week by week through my calendar and just jotting down important things that happened, people that came into my life, people that left my life, that happened a lot in the pandemic too, unfortunately. What new software I had learned, new projects that I had created that I'd never done before, right? It, it helped me really keep track and count the things that I did do instead of looking at, ah, oh, right, the year is kind of wasted because I can't do almost all of these things that I love. Well, 
yeah, almost all is still not all. And now I can find new things that I love, right? And uh, yeah, this year has been a year of reversing that. So the pandemic has been maybe winding down, I don't know, but it's opening up. So a lot of the things that weren't available to me for a while suddenly were. And now I'm balancing all of the things that I created and started doing during the shutdowns and opening up at the same time and figuring out, okay, how do I balance this? What's most important to me here? And keeping this annual review process in mind was super helpful because knowing that I want to end the year with things that I'm proud of on this list helped me sift and sort, I think, very elegantly through the things that weren't a fit. And not in every case say goodbye to them, but in in a lot of the cases, it was much easier to say, oh, I think I'm done with this now, because I was able to see it in the context of the big picture of my world. It's so important, as you said, to look back, especially after, you know, the last couple of years where things have been, you know, world has changed. And it's easy to go along with the common narrative of, wow, COVID has really been shit. And it's really been something that's shut down the world. And my God, how's my blah, 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 blah. But it it really depends on who you are, right? Because a lot of people had the best years of their life during COVID. What did you tell me that you learned computer skill? Yeah. Or you can look at it in the year in review and you can say, this is, this is what was great. Yeah. Here's some of the, here's some of the great things that happened. Some of the things that I did. Some of the people that I got to hang out with, like you say, some of the things that I got to let go of. Um, there's a lot of good stuff that can happen in any year. Yeah, definitely. And I think, uh, another piece that was really powerful for me, especially recently was not just putting the things that I am proud of on there, not just the things that I've accomplished, but the things that happened that I had to navigate. Right. So there were a couple of different times where I broke things and broke body parts and ended up having to heal from those. And a part of my very, rigid perfectionist brain had originally looked at those months as, oh yeah, that was another waste. Didn't really get to do anything. All I got to do was heal. I didn't get to do all these things that I learned. Oh wait, but what else did I do? Ah, yes. I learned some new resiliency skills, right? I learned how to do a lot more things left-handed, <laughs> right? I learned to walk on crutches properly. So yeah, just reminding myself that it's not all about the achievements. It's about who we become on the way and That's what I'm really looking for here. The achievements help me tap into that. And they remind me where this stuff came from. But it's really about who I have become along the way. When you said all I get to do is heal, I kind of chuckled. It reminds me of somebody saying, you know, I'm just listening. (laughs) What did I do? I'm just listening. And, you know, it's like that, that there's nothing, there's no such thing as just listening to somebody. There's no such thing as just healing. Like, as you said, like you learned resiliency, you learned how to do things in a different way. You learned that you learned uh, who were, who are the people around you that are true, true supports. You learned what do you need, you know, what do you bring to them, even though you're in a state that, you know, where you're not as mobile as typ- as you typically are. There's a whole bunch of stuff. There's nothing, no such thing as just always do is just healing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or just listening. There's a couple of things that I appreciate about having an annual re- review. One of them is just the practice in the acknowledgement. In the past, I've operated a lot in codependence type relationships. I've had a superhero complex, Superman complex, where, you know, I I get into something, into a relationship, particularly with women, get into a relationship because I can save them or because I think they need saving, which is 99% of the time just ridiculousness. And it was how I operated. I know this past year I had a, I had a situation come up where a, uh, a lady was complaining about something and, and I acknowledged the, I acknowledged what she was going through. And I, you know, I felt bad to, for her for an ex, to an extent. And I came away from it going, Whoa, that was a spot where I could have saved somebody. <laughs> and I didn't want to. And I did it. <laughs> so the whole, the whole idea, and that's the kind of acknowledgement that that isn't, I'm telling you that's incremental growth. This started when I was, 15 and saving my mom, you know, or younger than that and saving my sisters, you know? So, I mean, what am I, 23, 24 years old now? So it's been a (laughs) lifelong pattern. (laughs) I got to say, Sean, you don't look that great for 23. (laughs) (laughs) You don't think so? Yeah. Yeah. I love you very much. I just not treated you well, son. (laughs) (laughs) You look great for 45, though. (laughs) Oh, well, that's good. I'm a little older than that. So perfect. (laughs) 
So a lifelong pattern and something that just having the practice of acknowledging where I've changed kind of made me light up and go, oh, wow, there's something that I can now put in the past. I mean, I'm like, I'm not the guy that has a Superman complex. Damn, that is big growth. Like, think about how that's going to affect all of the rest of your future. That's right. And like we talked about, you know, like I said earlier, the child that's growing over a year time, it's years of growth. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so it's something that, you know, may not have really gone noticed. It's just a new way of operating in my new choices that had I not had the practice, may not have actually had the self-acknowledgement of that. Yeah. You know what? That reminds me. There's a story that one, I think Abraham Hicks talks about it a little bit, is a farmer, older farmer, he's lifting this calf over a fence every day in order to take the calf out to get food or whatever. I don't know why. You'd, you'd have a door in a fence. I don't know why he's lifting a fence. <laughs> but if he's lifting the calf every day over the fence for an entire year, the calf gets quite big but he's getting incrementally stronger every single day. So he finds it natural and easy to keep up with it. And eventually he still has to build a gate because it's a 1200 pound cow now, but (laughs) and then he's like, well, maybe I should have done that from the beginning. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I did. Like all of a sudden I was like, Oh, there's the gate. I don't have to be Superman anymore. (laughs) Nice. Just walk through that. I just walked through it. (laughs) Yeah. That's lovely. And, And I love that this is the cap on this playlist because we can, look at, okay, what new patterns have we created this year? What new patterns have we lived into that were different than we had before? Like I know I've had quite a few of those new patterns show up and it's pretty cool. It's cool to see it and to be like, oh my gosh, I have no idea what's happening next. I haven't lived this before in any other relationship. This isn't another face, another name kind of thing. This is different. Wow. I, I guess I have all the choices. I can do anything. So seeing as how you're 23 as well, I think that it, it has something to do a little more than I'm too old for that. What's the feeling that you know shifted inside you between where you were and where you are now? Well, you know, I think it's that identity piece is that at some point my identity was just I'm a really fun, interesting person and I want to experience different things with different people. And hey, let's check this out. It There was no cost to me at all of going out on the town with someone who didn't want to be seen with me in certain situations. And and I, like I understood, it felt completely rational and normal. And now, and in that experience in particular, we happened to be at a restaurant that I used to go to with my husband while I was married. And it was one of its favorite places. He and I had gone there to celebrate the holidays a couple of times. And what I realized was I was almost as embarrassed to be seen with someone that couldn't be seen with me as they were afraid of what they had thought had happened. And yeah, I guess it's that that's what that means to me. I'm too old for that. I don't want to be pulling the wool over anybody's eyes. And why? (laughs) I'm pretty cool as it is. I don't need to pretend to be any different. And if they're, if they don't, that's okay. That's up to them. That's the level that they're willing to be open and communicative with the people that matter to them, but it no longer works for me. Exactly. And for me, it was almost with that experience, it was almost like a new identification. Like I, I, I've said in the past, like I'm, I can get pretty good at in relationships or I've said in the past, I've got a Superman complex on that day at that moment that changed. Did you have an experience like that too? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I've had a lot of experiences like that. I talked about one of those experiences in the boudoir episode. I think that's episode 97 where I had this recognition of, oh, shit, I'm not just a podcaster. I'm an athlete, and I'm an athlete first. I'm an athlete and a dancer, then a podcaster, then a courtesan. And, wow, that changed the the meaning of my world quite a lot. But I've also had that in a lot of relationships. You know, There was an experience recently where I was out with a client, and we were out on the town, and it was this big holiday celebration, and something happened. And they had an interesting reaction that lit something up in me. And I realized, oh, I'm a different person now than when I started this industry. And what happened was that they thought they saw someone that would recognize them. And they were with me, who they are not supposed to be out on the town with, which, you know, people have good reasons for lying to their partners about what they're doing. And I'm not going to judge that. I am going to say it felt so weird 
to be in this city. Like, I think when I first started doing this work, going out on the city with strangers, it felt completely normal. But in that moment, on that night, it felt like I'm here in this amazing club in this city that I love and that loves me. This is my home. This is the place that I have put a lot of my effort and energy into and that I want to keep doing it. And someone doesn't want to be seen with me. Oh, fuck no. I'm too old for that. Not just I'm too old for that, but I would never put up with that in my personal life. And so it was this moment of, ah, shit, okay, I guess I can't go out in public anymore with people that are not okay with being seen with me. And that just changed. That's, that's who I had become, and that was me recognizing it. I'm too old for that. Would you say that it's a measure of, like, a, a, you have a different sense of value of yourself now than before? I think some of it is value. But I, I wouldn't say that I didn't value myself before. I think it was just that it didn't cost me anything before. I wouldn't say that I didn't value myself before. I would say that I was aiming at something different initially. And that's why the value thing didn't come up. It didn't create any friction because, I don't know, it just didn't matter at the time. That's an important piece. Like aiming at something different, I think, is a great way to say it. Because yeah. that morphs and shifts throughout our life. Yeah. And so something that may have been just fine before is not fine now. And that's all part of the our part of the growth process. And so being able to acknowledge is where I'm going with that. Being able to acknowledge and honor the growth that we've done and to say that's okay, that things are different now. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of wisdom and power in that. Part of what I like about this work of recognize is also that that piece, the self-affirmation piece. And so a piece of that for me is in, in recognizing these things, these different changes is, is the self-affirmation of, you know, this is who I am now. And not just self-affirmation, but self-affirmation from a perspective of non, non-judgmental, from a perspective of this is the great stuff that I've figured out. So far. Yeah. So far. Yeah. And that's subject to change. Absolutely. I'll see next year. Hopefully it will change. It will grow and shift. <laughs> right, right. You know, one of the other things that I really love about this process that I find so much value in is when I sit down and I recognize myself as I am, you know, that honest, sometimes hard look, but ju- usually it's just an honest, genuine, authentic, reality-based look at myself Especially over time, I've noticed this to be true, which is why I'm a lot braver now at stepping up and saying what matters to me. But what I've found is that over time, the more I show people who I am, the more possibility there is of being accepted for who I am. And realizing that until I'm willing to share something with someone, there's no way they can love me for it (laughs) or in spite of it or any of that. Right. And being in a line of work for the last decade that it's not always socially acceptable has given me a lot of incentive to create a stability for myself, to know that I am following what matters to me. I'm following my own code of ethics, whether or not other people agree with it. It's still something that matters that I'm in integrity with myself and being able to see that and share that with other people allows me to be accepted. And without that, you can't hide who you are from people and ever really feel accepted and loved. So, you know, I think this really, really matters. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and that sort of the, the self-reflection that you're talking about, the being accepted by others, that's the juice. That's the relationships. That's the that's the juicy relationships, the close ones, the ones that the ones that we really you know gain something from, whether it's polyamorous relationships or monogamous relationships, or romantic or non-romantic, or romantic. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. It's any any time that we want a true, genuine connection with somebody else it has to start with the true, genuine connection with ourself. Yeah. And this process of taking a look at ourselves periodically helps us to keep on top of who we are, and therefore helps us to be able to get more and more genuine relationships. Yeah. And you know, there's another skill that this has helped me develop. And and I think it's a 
useful one worth mentioning is that skill of discernment versus judgment, right? So I'm definitely got a bit of a rigid perfectionist mind sometimes, and I could use this kind of experiment to trigger myself as to like, well, look at what you didn't get done. Look at how far you've, you know, you missed the mark at what you were aiming at. So recognizing that when I do this process, I'm going into it, choosing to have a light of discernment instead of judgment. I'm going in there saying, I want to see what's real and see what's true about myself and about my life. And in order to judge something, you have to create a story around it. And if you can let yourself not create the story, or at least not repeat the stories that you've had created in your head the entire time, because they've always been there, right? They're, they're sitting there if they're active, they're sitting there regularly and coming up in your brain. But recognizing that that's not the place for that. This is not the place to decide whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong. This is the place to look at accurately, clearly, who have I become and why does it matter? It's so important to set the pretext of yes. this work as yes. that. Yeah. This is capital N-O-T, an opportunity, not an opportunity to beat oneself up. This is only an opportunity to gain clarity. And which is also doing this once a year is also great practice for doing this every day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I get that we all make mistakes. We're all at times ashamed of things that we've done. We would love to do it better. And the best way to do that is through gaining really clear discernment of what happened. How can I do it better next time? Instead of the, there's, there's just no, nothing good that comes out of, of, of shame. Hell yes. Ooh. All right. Couldn't have said it better myself. And, you know, the other thing that I found is really cool about this process is that as I update my internal view of myself, as my internal identity shifts and changes and grows, hopefully, I start to notice things. Sometimes there are opportunities that have always been there. And sometimes there are things that just show up out of the blue that I'm like, if someone had asked me to do this a week ago, I would have been like, no, what are you talking about? I'm not qualified for that. Or I, I don't, I'm not interested in that. Hang on. But now that I've taken a few moments and reassessed and looked at things a little bit differently, sometimes those opportunities that show up, whether they're work opportunities or I think often relationship opportunities, different people are suddenly attracted to me. People that would help me fulfill those old patterns that I'm stepped out of now, I lose track of them or they lose track of me or they just disappear off the radar somehow. Or even better, we end up creating a whole new pattern together, which I find to be most satisfying. But oftentimes, it's people will just not be a match anymore and then they'll move on. And that can be its own kind of lovely, right? Being able to be in each other's lives for a season, a reason or a lifetime, it's it's pretty cool. And particularly with romantic relationships, I feel like the new people that show up are so different. I don't necessarily know how to react to them anymore because these old patterns that were my normal no longer apply. Now what's my normal? I don't know. It's a blank slate. Let's find out. Let's see what the new normal is for this. Let's see how connected we can be, how much we can support each other and what that looks like, and especially outside of codependency, right? Dependency is awesome. I 100% am on board with that. <laughs> you know, somebody asked me, like, what would it be like to date somebody that didn't need saving? <laughs> <laughs> what would it be like, Sean? Right? I mean, that's, and, and that's an entirely new concept. You know, it's, an, it's and it sounds liberating, actually. You know, it sounds, it sounds like a normal, healthy relationship and something that I can get excited about rather than actually, like you were saying, attracting a woman that does need saving. When a man is putting out, or a man or a woman, but when a person is putting out the energy of I am a superhero mm -hmm. and I'm here to help. They attract the people that says I need a superhero and I need help versus, um, versus the opposite. Yeah. And for someone like me, if I am open to the beauty of kitchen table poly and of the value that my metamors and my partners can bring to my other partners, there's a whole lot more potential in there, which I'm finding is really playing out in my life right now. Like, I think I told you a little bit earlier, but my my week has been a crazy whirlwind of hanging out with my friends and partners and doing podcast things and dance things and 
you know, we went to the art walk last night with two of my partners and one of their friends. And it was just neat to be able to do these completely normal things, but to do it my way with the people that matter to me. And yeah. So it seems to me that going through many of the um, processes and steps and things that we've talked about in this playlist and then doing this evaluation is kind of like the final step in breaking a lot of these patterns. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good way of describing it. Though I think the final step really is the different choices you make now that you have acknowledged, recognized, and honored your new identity, right? Because that's that's the end of the pattern and the beginning of the next one. Right. Yeah. And not really final because you're doing this every year. Exactly. Right? On a periodic basis. Yeah. Yeah. Ho- however often floats your boat. <laughs> right. There you go. Whatever floats your boat. But you're <laughs> But you're updating things. You're updating your programs. You're updating your identif- identity. You're updating your your world. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. are. Yeah, really good stuff. And you know, the other thing that I love about this, I know this episode has basically been me saying, my favorite thing about this, my favorite thing about that. But in the process of recognizing who I've become and how much of a badass I am, I inevitably start to notice who has helped me get there. The people that have been around, the people that have helped me change my mind about something. Maybe it's just one thought form that gets changed and then all of a sudden there's a whole new world that's opened up for me. And that person that put that one new thought form in my head, I I value them and they matter a lot. And being able to look back and go, oh yeah, that's where that came from. Cool. Now I have more appreciation for them, more appreciation for myself more fodder for my gratitude journal or my joy bank, right? And it creates this really beautiful virtuous cycle. So it's the end of the last step in the pattern, but the beginning of the next one. And you can step into the new pattern with all of this joy and resilience that you've gotten from the last mission that you've been on, right? It's true like a video game. You got all these new points. Yeah, that piece of gratefulness, it's so easy to be grateful when I can look back and go, this is how far I've come. Grateful, like you said, grateful for the surroundings, grateful for the people. And particularly for me, it's important for me to remember to be grateful for myself. Yeah. I can look back and say, nice work, Sean. That was, <laughs> I mean, look at what you've done and look at, you know, look at how far you've come. And that's a, that's a really good piece for me personally. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I love it. I love this virtuous cycle of recognizing who we are, appreciating, stepping forward into something new and seeing what shows up there because it always surprises me. And that is how you are helping people create that joyful, pleasure central life that, which is why people listen to this. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have created something powerful for yourself and you want to share it with somebody, send us a message. We would love to hear and we'd even put it on the show if you want. Love it. So <laughs> <laughs> nice. Can't wait. Well, Rebecca, you are truly radiant. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, thank you for the episode. We'll see you next time. Bye. Hey there, Pleasure Seeker. Well, that's it for today's conversation. Here at Pleasure Central Radio, we love using conscious communication, science geekery, and copious amounts of true pleasure to improve our partnerships, our money, and our love lives. And we hope you do too. If you loved what you heard here, we'd love a review. You can do this easily on podcast players like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it's an easy way to help more people discover the show without you having to actually bring it up with them. To hear other episodes of the podcast and get notified immediately when a new episode is released, follow me on your favorite podcast player. Find out more and get in touch at PleasureCentralRadio.com. Your thought to ponder today is, Over time, the more I show people who I am, the more possibility there is of being accepted for who I am. And realizing that until I'm willing to share something with someone, there's no way they can love me for it, (laughs) or in spite of it, or any of that, right? Thanks for listening to Pleasure Central Radio, hosted by Rebecca Beltran. The co-host for this episode is Sean. Technical production by me, Katerina, with advice from our podcast consultant, Sandy Waters. 
Rebecca gets significant creative feedback from her beta listener group. For this episode, special thanks goes to Andrew, Mary, Bob, and Josh. And to anyone else we might have missed, you are loved. We look forward to your company on the next episode. Ciao.